I'm Reverend Harrison Roy Heskin. When we begin the path, sometimes we do not know, for the path is windy, and we do not see the bends or the end. But as we travel the path, it becomes straight and narrow until we reach our goal. Sit back and intensify now your attention, concentration, observation into a meditative state and open your contemplative and superconscious natures to absorb blessings. Blessings of light.
blessings of light. Blessings of light, and welcome to Daniel. We can start the chakras, the path to enlightenment, the levels of mind, the colors, the different planes, the powers of light and energy, the universal power that's available to every man, woman, and child on this planet, to every creature that uses this power. Nothing is manifest without color, light, sound, and motion. The four creative principles of the universe. Color, light, sound, and motion. The power of God's manifestations. As we begin to walk the path, we don't know where it starts, or how it starts in this lifetime many times. But soon we find ourselves on this path. And eventually every human being will walk the path to God consciousness in a God conscious way. There are some that are conscious of God, but God consciousness is different than conscious of God. I mean, you can ask people, you believe in God and say, yeah, I'm conscious of God. All the religions have a consciousness of God. But to be God consciousness, you must be a a God man or God woman. This is to realize that you are God expressing without the arrogance of thinking you are the only one and that everyone has to come to you and worship you. And this, this was the, the fallacy that the um, pharaohs and a lot of the ancients got involved in. They realized they were God and so they had it all people bowed down to them and they played the life and death cycle over them dominated them they weren't always malevolent in this power of uh, directing people from that arrogance man fell into the dark age of the Kali age some 2000 years of darkness but before that Kali age had been fallen into God said his son Jesus Christ sent the Christ light through Jesus Christ Jesus the Christ Christ Jesus to give us hope and show us a pathway through that darkness and into the light well this 2000 years is ending in the predictions of Muhammad, he predicted in the end days of before the millennium changes, the second millennium change, that the Christians would betray Christ by espounding separation instead of unity. We got it, you don't. We're all going to heaven, and you're all going to hell unless you come our way. And in doing so, they began to... Um, bring forth this separation. It is the illusion of separation that must be understood to understand the individual manifestations of God. Separation, the illusion of separation is not a bad thing because without separation we wouldn't have the limitations of form. And the first law of manifestation was separation. When God separated himself from the light and looked at the light within himself. Now see, God wasn't looking at some light that was outside. When God hovered over the deep and he saw the light and said, let there be light, and he saw the light and then he said the light was good. He didn't say, well, the darkness is bad. He just recognized the light was good. And he realized that was a, at that point there was a separation. And so that was the first law of manifestation. In this separation, the powers of suggestions held by the rays of light, like the angels carrying those messages, shot in through all of creation, angels, archangels, cosmic, angelic hosts, began to manifest in the heavenly fields. And these heavenly fields then became denser and denser as they entered into mind and then into matter. It was a descending in separation, becoming stronger and stronger, more dense, more dense, more compact, until we reach this most solid plane, the physical dimension. 
then we were to uh, literally as spirits bounce off of this dimension and not to be bound in it we came to this planet each one of us out of the body of humanity humanity came as a whole being there's only one humanity there's not many humanities there's only one and all peoples come out of that one humanity no matter what race what color what creed what practice what religion there's still only one out of that one humanity that humanity was sent here in the Hyborian race the Hyborian race was uh, theracalized spiritual beings that tended this planet worked with the elementals we in that consciousness we in that consciousness you and I in that consciousness we created these flowers out here and the trees we created all the things to beautify this planet there were yogas that I met that realized how they set for centuries creating the rose the highest vibratory flower in the flower kingdom the great redwood tree the highest evolution of trees within the tree structure and so all these things were created in order for us to glorify God but then man began to get caught in the creations and drop from the Hyborian race to the Lemurian race the Lemurians were the first manifestation in the physical dimension of human beings and there were several body types that were experimented with for the human form before it had come to this form one of those was a purple being body that had a fixed head upon it and this didn't last then the giants were 14, 16, 18 feet were tried in fact the Tibetans have two mummified bodies of these giants a woman some 14 feet tall and a man some 16 feet tall and their bodies are still in the Himalaya mountains in Tibet as man came into the first teaching the teaching of the red tree they call it the red tree as each race developed they developed a chakra an energy vortex in the physical body to manifest this greater light of God upon the earth but the bodies were not of spirit now they were of animal body and so man had to overcome the animal nature of the animal body and so the teaching of the red tree in Lemuria was to teach us of this root chakra of the procreation power of the human being the animal to reproduce bodies for more human spirits to come into and we had to survive upon this planet man was here totally the Neanderthal you hear about is actually the fallen man not these lumen beings that were God conscious these were the ones that ran away from the light and wanted to stay here and that consciousness is still in the root chakra people don't want to leave their bodies they want to keep this body forever they fell in love with this body the red ray and they wanted to keep a physical body forever and forever and forever which was against evolution the evolving back to the Godhead and we were supposed to learn the individualities so a lot of men kind mankind which one had a womb and one didn't have a womb called the womb wound man and the man the wound man carried the race nourished the race they held the procreation and it was held within them not like laying an egg and going off from it like the turtles do or some other creatures do this was to nourish the child like God nourishes us to exercise God power 
just as God bore forth the children of light and of consciousness and of being, we bore children. As the Lemurians developed, they developed three particular areas to their continent of Lemuria, or the continent of Mu. This continent was in the Pacific Ocean, and it reached down to the Easter Islands and up to Hawaii and over towards uh, Japan. And in the uh, southern part of this, they had miners. And they mined copper and silver. And copper coins and silver coins were then minted for the, uh, made for the exchange. And the copper coin was worth more than the silver coin because it was bigger. Man thought bigger's better. And didn't realize that each of these metals are the solidification of light rays in the mineral kingdom until you have the solidification of the diamond which is the highest manifestation in the mineral kingdom the crystal manifesting gold is the sunlight rays manifesting in the mineral kingdom and that's why they wanted the gold because it was the solidification of sun the sunlight Diamonds are created with heat and pressure over a long period of time. So each one of us are becoming a diamond in consciousness of humanity under heat and pressure. And you know how your life is. There's a heat and there's a pressure to it. As you grow in this clarity, you begin to facet each area of your consciousness, just like a diamond's facet. And you facet the, the uh, facet of your physical plane by the understanding of the energy and power of this root chakra that you have in you that gives you the ability of awakened consciousness, of rejuvenation, of procreation, of security, of solidity on the physical dimension. Well, after a period of time, they had uh, uh, seafarers in one part of the uh, Lemuria, and then they had farmers in another part, and these miners, and these were the three major uh, ones. They were in the south. They had the the moon goddess and the uh, sun god depicted in those statues. Uh, the moon goddess was made out of a uh, a more transitory material of wood and that, and it would decay. But the the uh, the male aspect was put into those big heads that you see. That was the male aspect of the god to them. To become solid. To become solid. Master over the solidity of this planet. To participate in it. When they had the whole thing, they gave it up for this individual body instead of realizing they were individual manifestations. And it was hard for them to understand this in the principality. Even though you're an individual human, you're still humanity. Even though you're an individual human, you have uh, access to the collective consciousness of every, every other human being. But what happened then, we, that continent, from the mining and from the power of Selene, which was the ability to join the minds together at such a strength that, that, that they could move physical objects, with the mind. That power had got went through humanity all the way to the Egyptian period where they moved stone and things with their minds at that particular point. But in the power of Selene, they were moving this. So they were taking so much energy out from the continent and under the continent, the continent began to collapse. Earthquakes and the continent sunk. The mountain peaks of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea were 30,000 feet in the air, and now they're at the bottom of the sea, but still sticking out of the water. Easter Islands are still there. And the remnants of these peoples went to uh, China, to, uh, to uh, Africa, and to South America. Back in the 1950s, a uh, anthropologist named uh, Anderson 
went into the valley of Mexico, Mexico Valley. And he was in, given the impression that he should dig in this one place, so they started digging. And they were going through these layers, and they, they hit this volcanic layer, and they went through this volcanic layer, and there was some 200 feet down in the ground they were digging. 200 feet they got into the ground. And they found a temple. And they on, um, you know, they, they dug up that temple, and there was a, um, it was shaped like a horseshoe. It had a, a place you come in, and there were treasure and food houses on this side, and quarters, and a temple, and then there was a, an altar and a temple in the middle of this, like a courtyard. And the temple that was on the side, there was a smaller temple, they were in there taking pictures, and they'd set their camera up, and the cameras, uh, the pod, one of the legs got caught between some rocks, and they were trying to get it, and they went to pry, and they found out the rocks uh, was, were right next to this altar, and when they moved them, the altar lifted up, and under the altar was a, a stone box with 26 stone tablets in that told all about Lemuria. It took them years to decipher this. You can read these in the books called The Continent of Mu, The Children of Mu, and get this information. So it's not, uh, I'm, I'm not talking from something that is, that is myth or legend, but has actually been proven this age, this time, within the last hundred years. So Anderson, deciphering this, found, these, found this out and found out that they, they had this power, Selene. That the, then the dominant minds were taking over, where some wanted to be better than others. The way we didn't talk as we talk now, we transferred thought. We used our telepathy, we transferred thought to one another. When we would transfer a thought form, it had a completeness in it. We could say that uh, there's a man running uh, by the creek, and there's a bear chasing him, and it's near a particular kind of a tree, and a, some type of terrain, and the whole of the picture in dimensions were given one to the other. But see, then there was those that wanted to keep separate and secrets, so the mind began to separate, and when it separated, they lost the power to keep stabilization to the continent, and it sunk. The other continent that was manifest on the planet began to split and that's what we have, the continents that we have now from that one. And when it split, there was a part of it that had split in the Atlantic Ocean, and the second root race, the Atlanteans, manifested the Atlantean race, manifested in that place. They had come to that place. And the first root race ascended. So after 2,000 years, they ascended. So every 2,000 years, the human race is to ascend. Well, then came the laggards. Other beings from other solar systems and that began to come to this planet and influence the um, Atlanteans. And the Atlanteans then wanted to get off the planet. So they were using uh, the light. They used stellar light, and they could impact it through a crystal in the top of a pyramid into rooms, and they could also use moonlight and sunlight in the same way. And what they would do is they would frack this light in Lemuria through this crystal, and then the whole families would come and have their auras charged so the whole family would be a group. And so it was creating the family principalities at that particular point. Well, they began to use this crystal in power, and they could draw the light down through their bodies and out of their feet and create a disk if they could float along the surface of the earth, whether it was earth or water, they could just float across there. Well, some of the laggards and remnants uh, of other beings were setting up places upon the planet till man uh, claimed his God-given right. And they were being thrown off the planet. And some of the priests, when, uh, when the misuse of the power and uh, was coming and they were manifesting this light, it began to penetrate the planet and penetrate their particular uh, uh, Atlantis, this, the largest part of Atlantis, 
and it created uh, uh, an empty space or a vacuum underneath that planet uh, surface and that continent began to sink. And the last island to sink was called Poseidon. That was the last island that sunk. And the masters of, uh, of the flames took the ascension flame to Luxor, Egypt from Atlantis to hold it for humanity. And up to the time of Christ, that temple, uh, the Ascension Temple was still there, and Christ studied in this attention in this Ascension Temple. But then the Vandals came, and they destroyed the temple, and so the Masters lifted it to the etheric realms, so to be out of the reach of physical beings. And they started lifting all these temples and all these holy sites to this etheric realm when they would be destroyed on the physical plane. Over Dar Jingling, India, over Luxor, Egypt, over Lake Titicaca, over uh, Banff, uh, Lake uh, Louise, and uh, you know, over Mount Shasta, all these great mountains, they began to hook the rays of light into these etheric cities of light and energy. And people would see these great etheric cities. Our divine sight began to fall away from us, and we were beginning to lose the uh, power of sight, but it still was maintained into the next third root race, the Aryans. And the Aryan race that uh, came at that particular time, um, manifesting the light and energy, the third root race, then we had the fourth, and now we're in the fifth. This fifth root race are as, uh, beings not on the path. The first root race was still on the path, the sixth fell on the path, the third was still on the path, the fourth started falling away from the path, and the fifth root race are not on the path. Most of the beings are not on the path, because they fell into this darkness of human ego, and felt that now this is their planet, they can do whatever they want with it, with no regards to God or to the planet itself. And we have now come to a very strong abuse of our beautiful Mother Earth, an entity that is growing an entity that is evolving. Earth is an entity. It's a conscious entity. Just like you're a conscious entity, the Earth hurts. The Earth can feel. The Earth has mind. The Earth has body. And it was to nourish all that we were to protect upon this planet. So we were to protect here. That's why we are the survivors over many other creatures on this planet. When the dinosaurs here, we weren't in a physicalized form. We were more etheric beings. Now we are more physical than we are spiritual. We've fallen to that point. But now the great transition is here. The great movement to break the fifth race is not on the path, back onto the path, and the children, with their powers and their nervous system, is now developing and manifesting the third eye, the uh, brow chakra. So each one of the root races up to this point, up to the fifth root race, the, bra the throat chakra, which we are the creators, localized. We've reached that point. But see, the Lemurians overdeveloped the emotional chakra and overdeveloped the will chakra, because this was being created. And it began to take more power. So the mind takes more power than, uh, lower mind takes more power than some of the other chakras because they overdeveloped it with their willfulness. And so we, have as human beings, have inherited this heavy willful energy as humans, and now we have to learn in the blue ray to surrender that will to God and let God's will be done, the divine plan, God's plan for humanity to raise us back up to where we love the planet and help its evolution and transcend this dimension. The universe is, you may think that there is a space that is empty between here and the moon. It is not. It is filled. It is filled by dimension, not by the physical. And so there is physical planets, there's astral planets, there's mental planets, there's psychic planets, there's creative planets, there's spiritual planets out there. 
there's planets of energy and light beyond the sight of the physical. Your physical sight is a very small part of the whole spectra of creation, and that visible part goes red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, from God, his sight got narrower. Now with the increase of light on the planet, our sight is expanding, and we're able to see things that are beyond the physical. We can see the emotions of another, but we're fooled by the physical eyes, not the essence of sight, but the objects of sight, or the organs of sight, rather than sight. Sight is not the eyes. Sight comes from perception. Pure perception is perfect sight. And you can see without physical eyes. When you close these eyes, you can see light within you. I can put my fingers over your eyes and you'll still see light in there. Where's that light coming? It's the light within. You're beginning to see the inner light again. We've lost touch with our own inner light and became superficial beings. Now with this increase of light and energy, over these last years upon this planet, since 1967, there's been an increase and a leaping of consciousness. You know, uh, as soon as they put a computer out in the market, it's already obsolete. We're moving so fast because what they're doing is everything that's out here is an externalization of what's in you. This chair is an externalization of the shape of this body, like this, see? To support this body, so it's an externalization to support it off the ground. See? The movie is an exper ex externalization of your imagination. How you look up there and you see the movies on the back of your brow while they put that outside. Music is within you. It's a song constantly going on. If you listen to your native, you'll hear this music within you. But we've externalized it and put it through instruments and all kinds of things. Everything's an ex The computer is an externalization of the subconscious mind. The computer is an externalization of the subconscious mind. Just like you program the, the computer, you programmed your subconscious mind. And as we learn how the computer works, we'll learn how the subconscious mind works. Well, the sixth root race of these young kids, they know how the subconscious mind works, but the adults that bore them don't know how their own subconscious minds work. So to operate a computer, something's natural for little kids because they're not conditioned and closed off and driven in, in separation. They want to be out there. They want to go every place. They want to see everything. They want to do everything now. They no longer want to be bound. The sixth root race is a race of freedom beings, and they will experience the heaven on earth. The last evolution of man is the light body. The seventh root race will be light bodies, the most highly developed nervous system on the planet the light body. That was demonstrated by Jesus Christ on the island of Patmos, shown to John, the beloved, that beautiful body of light. You can read about it in the book of Revelations, the beautiful body of light. Well, see, humanity is still so much in love with this body, full of feci and urine and acids and bacterias and all kinds of stuff. They think this is such a great body. This body's corrupt. If we didn't take care of it, it would decay very quickly. It would fall apart. And you see people falling apart. They have dis-ease. They're not at ease. They're diseased. And so we suffer in the fifth root race from the sins of the fathers. Their separations and they pass these separations instead of the oneness onto the mass of humanity. But there has been a 10% manifestation of man that has held the original power. It's been passed down through generation to generation of the original power of humanity upon this planet, dominion over the earth, 
the sea, and the sky, and it's all that's in them. Every 50 years, they have a group of holy beings that come down to the uh, Indian Ocean, out of the Himalaya Mountains and everything. They come down, and they all stand at the shoreline, and they look out into the ocean, and out of the ocean rises a great alabaster temple white alabaster, made of alabaster rock, rises out of the sea every 50 years. When's the next time? The, the last time was in the teens, the, uh, I think it was 1917. And at that time, the uh, one of the yogas came down, and he had such power, he could cut up the human body, scatter it, and then put it back together, all with his mind all with the power of his mind. He cut up human bodies and drew them back together to show them that this body is an illusion. And they come down, they demonstrated their powers, and they went back to the mountains. The archats, masters, saints, holy beings. That was just after the golden ray of the theosophical energies, the combinations of all religious structures, the seven lines of religious structures, were manifest through Blavatsky and the Theosophy group that founded and manifest upon the planet, made a solidity to the great white brotherhood of the Ascended Masters. And it didn't say the great white brotherhood of Ascended Male Masters, because there are many, many lady, there's as many lady masters as there are male masters, but it seems like we carry the names of the men better than we carry the names of the females. Because the men are more aggressive. They want to be out there where the woman didn't need that. She, she didn't need that glorification out there. She was glorified in childbirth and procreation and carrying forth the human race. So the Great White Brotherhood of Ascended Masters descended upon the planet at that particular time. Now Moria and Duakul and and uh, Kathumi. Uh, these three were the three wise men. They had uh, they gave uh, the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh to Christ. Three powers of light and energy. Uh, the wealth, gold. They give him the frankincense uh, for to reach uh, God, and the myrrh for healing. The power of healing. So those were the three powers given to the Christ. Wealth the power of wealth. They never had to worry about any needs. That God provided all needs. The signal. He would have perfect healing power and he'd have the perfect power to stay in tune with God, the frankincense. And so that was the meaning of those particular powers and energy. Well, the Theosophical Society was misunderstood a lot by humanity because Blavatsky came out with a, um, a periodical which was called Lucifer. And it told all about how uh, we fall short of God. Well, when they did that, the Christians at that particular time went against her, saying, uh, you know, that she's evil because she's talking about Lucifer instead of Christ. That she was telling us how the Luciferic light and everything worked so we could be protected against it, not to do it. Everything you learn is not for you just to do it. A lot of it, you must have the discretion to know what not to do and what to do. Well, in this uh, evolution of humanity and the manifestations of the race, the karmic board that is on this planet, evolution began to slip in this dark age. We had gurus that had to shine the light in this dark age to lead us along the path. So each guru or each guru means guru. Gu, darkness, ru, light. The teachers of darkness and light. That's what a guru is. It teaches you the, the power of darkness and light. And that's what that means. A sadguru means God within you teaches you that. Many uh, images God can use for the Sadhguru. Christ can appear to you, uh, Buddha can appear to you, I can appear to you. I have him. I 
appeared to my students for 22 years on airplanes because I learned the secret to identify with the chance. When you say, Om Sadgaru, you're not calling somebody else, you're asking for that to come up in you. You're asking for that here, you're calling it here. And so every chant you do, the Lord's Prayer or a mantra or a chant is given to you, is to awaken that power in you, not to run it out here someplace. Because when you become awakened, you will exude that power outwards. That some people are just reflecting it off of themselves rather than taking it to heart, to experience, to understanding, to observation, and to knowledge. That's what it means. They have become ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. They ignore things. They they know it's there. Ah, I'm pay attention. I'm too busy. I'm got to pay attention over here. And that's what ignorance is. And you hear a lot of ignorance in humanity today. They don't want to pay attention to this or pay attention to that. They know there's God. They know if they did certain things, they'd be better off. But they don't have time because they're too much caught in their ego, uh, getting material stuff, materialistic mind. Uh, then the pressures and intimidations of of men over men. Uh, if you don't pay your bill, I'll come and take your car. If, uh, I'll take your house if you don't give me that money. You know, those that kind of intimidation is, is a pressure on humanity. How many people own a house? Not very many. Most people are paying for a house that a bank owns. Property is owned mainly by people of finance. And the uh, Jewish community was great in getting finance and getting wealth, and they knew it well. And a lot of other races are, were against them because they had all this power. And uh, even with all that power, they kept falling from the grace of God, and they finally got scattered into the world, and they didn't come back together till after World War II. That was the first time in thousand and over a thousand years that the Jews had their homeland, the God-given land that God had led them to and gave to them. Because they didn't pass it on. They didn't pass it on. They decided to keep it for themselves. When you don't pass it on, you'll be shaken up and thrown back out in the world. The Tibetans did not pass it on. They wanted to stay up there in the Himalayas. They didn't want anybody to come up. And now they're thrown out into the world. And we're getting the grace of all the teachings, aren't we, in humanity now. So anytime you try to hide it, hoard it, keep it to yourself, God will turn you inside out, throw you out in the world. I remember uh, the BBC when I was in Bombay, India, and they were uh, there uh, asking the Dalai Lama, uh, questions and asked the Dalai Lama, uh, how are you going to get revenge on these uh, Chinese that come up there and killed a million of your people in one week? One week, a million people in Tibet were killed by the Chinese when they come in. Because see, Tibetans didn't have any army. They were uh, religious based. But see, they weren't mental and physical based. So they had to be grounded you see what I'm saying? And sent back out to share with the world. So the Dalai Lama, he didn't even hesitate. He says, oh, there is no thought of revenge. Your enemies teach you patience. He says, isn't it miraculous that God took a million people at once? lifted a million people at once. See, he didn't see it as a destruction. He saw it as a liberation. So you can look at this world as destruction or being <coughs> liberated. When you're losing certain things, it's because you're being liberated from those things. And if you don't give them up easily, they'll just be taken from you. And I see people try to keep and try to keep and try to keep they may be working in some position they're not supposed to be working in. And pretty soon it'll be taken away because they're not supposed to be there. They may be living in a place that they're not supposed to be living. Pretty soon that'll be taken away from them. They might have been 
told to go there for a period of time, but then they lag. They're supposed to move on, and they don't. That'll be taken away. That's the grace of God. You should understand that. Thank you, God, for liberating me from these things, the bondage of the earth. And so the things that we, a lot of times, think is, is destructive or bad for us, it's because we're emotionally attached to it. We're mentally attached to it. We're physically attached. We want to stay there. and we want, we want a constant on the physical plane. We want it to be the same on the physical plane as it is in heaven. Heaven is constant. The love of God is the same yesterday, today, and always. The truth of God is the same yesterday, today, and always. The purity, the perfection, the oneness, the wholeness of that one. Whether you call it God or oneness or that one we, you can't say anything about. <laughs> you know, there's one religion I was studying in uh, Hinduism, one sect, that said, you know, you, there's no name. You can't give it a name because it's, whatever name, it's not it. But whatever name you give it is it. So it's all names and no names. They went, ah, that's different than Christianity because they said, well, there's only one name, Jesus Christ, that will get you there, see? And he says, well, if you get caught on any name, then you don't get there because you're on a name. A name is a limitation. And how can you reach oneness with limitation? So what was supposed to happen uh, through the Christ spirit was we were all to become one. The Jew and the Gentile, everything was to become one. Well, the Jews went against that oneness because they wanted to keep, we're the chosen ones, we're going to make it, 144,000 of us, that was their thing, we're, they're, they're the only ones that are going to make it into the bosom of Abraham, and the rest of you can go to hell. <laughs> they didn't actually say that, but that was practically what they said. And Christ said, no, that's not the way it is. This is for everybody. So there was a schism because the, uh, the assembly that was over uh, the Jews at that particular time had so much power, they didn't want to give up their power, and that's why they were taken over by the Romans because the Romans came in there with physical power to take them over because they wouldn't give up the spiritual power. So if, you're, if you realize what's coming against you is what's freeing you, then you will move much quicker on the path. What's coming against you is freeing you, not binding you. If you have uh, someone that is very hard on you, it's because they are teaching you something. You need to find out what the lesson is here that I need to learn. Because we have fallen from the direct contact of the universal mind of man when we used to transfer our thoughts one to another and we were all open auras, we could see each other, we fell in the darkness, our sight went to a lower level, narrowed in the spectra till all we had was this color awareness. And this is not all the colors. You notice when you're in meditation that you see some colors, you try to describe those colors, they, you, I, w I just wish that they had some paints or something that could show those colors. But these are shadows of those colors. These are just shadows of the color. Because the colors, each one of these, are alive. They have life in them. They have life in them. They have substance in them. Different densities of substance, different vibratory rates. The vibrational manifestation tells you the density or the fineness of the manifestation. The vibrational rate of energy in the electromagnetic field, the play of the electromagnetic field, you will not find electricity without magnetics, you will not find magnetics without electricity. You will find, and then that field is also supported by a creative and destructive field in the center of that, which is assembling and disassembling of light and energy, changing forms. And so there's the this uh, wheel of destruction and creation going on in this electromagnetic field of light and energy. And these are the six principles of life force manifesting in every form. 
every form, from the smallest uh, um, parsec of time, the smallest quirk in the atom. I think they found something now smaller than the quirks. Did you know what one of the name of the quirk, one quirk is named love, and there's another quirk named uh, truth in the atoms. And scientists have gave them that, those names. <laughs> the love quirk holds the atom together, and the truth quirk holds it in reality. Isn't that interesting? And so they named it love and truth. <laughs> but see, they don't have any wisdom in the quirks. <laughs> they forgot, they haven't found the wisdom because it's deeper within deeper within. But these two is violet fire. Love and truth quirks are violet fire within the atom. The transmutation fire of light and consciousness to bring spirit into matter and matter into spirit. That's what the violet fire is for. Well, there's no yellow in there. No intellectual mind. No thinking mind. No reason. No logic. There's none of those system manifestations that come out of the yellow ray. See, the systems, all systems on a physical dimension come out of the yellow ray. Your circulatory system, respiratory system, the skeleton system, the organ system, the glandular system, the uh, ecological systems, the, all the, the, ma the mathematical systems, all of these are coming out of the yellow ray. So when you pray in the yellow ray, you say, give me the master over all systems in space and in time. The systems of the planets, the systems of the constellations, the six systems of the great uh, Milky Way, <laughs> the 40 billion light years spanning across this particular neblic structure that our universe flows in. But there are more than just this one universe. There are nine universes around the great center sun. We have the Orion universe, because it's in that direction, on one side of us, which is a uh, dark universe, and on the other side we had Andromeda, which is a light universe. Some 2,000 years ago, a star that was as large as this whole solar system, a star as large as the solar system, blew up in the Andromeda and sent across the void to hit this universe waves of light. And we've been experiencing them now in harmonic conversions. That's what those ripples are, a positive energy coming from Andromeda into this particular plane, into this universe, and sweeping across this universe, purifying as it comes. And that's the increasing light that is coming upon this so-called photon field. Photons are just light particles. And somebody's come up with that name now. That we've been teaching the light manifestation since before the turn of the century. From uh, the, the theosophical level, in the gold level, and we've been teaching it from the white level from the time of Christ. That this great light is coming upon the earth. We are all going to be blessed by this Christ light or this white light and increase. Well, those whose auras are reaching out now further, the leaders and that, you've been seeing them. They're going through a lot of changes. Their change must balance the subjective and objective field. It's no longer we go separate and go off to the mountains or off to the ashram. The victory of ascension is now won in the marketplace. In your family, in your job, in your world, in your affairs, is the victory, the final victory of ascension. And this ascension will be accomplished by those that are advanced in the fifth root race and by the seventh root, or sixth root race as they move into the seventh. They will move from the more physicalized form, transformed into the incorruptible bodies of light that Jesus Christ demonstrated as he went around in those 40 days after he went up the mountain for and see, he was crucified. For 40 days, he peered around the world. He peered to them down in South America. They saw the great white, and they, they said, this great white spirit's coming back. He told us so. And they have it in their legends and myths. Uh, this great white spirit's coming back here to Hawaii. They call him Lono. 
And a great white spirit came there and saw them all purity. And because they weren't pure, he got in a canoe and rowed off into the ocean. And they said, well, someday he'll come rowing back and, be, and teach us the purity again. See? The, in the South American Indians, uh, in the, um, the Navajo Indians, they also have a, uh, a uh, sacred Jesus, Jesus, that appeared to them. Uh, appearing to the Indians in, in North America here, Christ appeared to them, the great white spirit. The great white spirit. Because he appeared in the form of a man then into this white light to show them this is the way. This is the way at all races. So he appeared to every race on the planet before he came back and in front of a crowd of 500, which his disciples and his mothers was in, he walked up the mountain of transfiguration to the top where Moses and Isaac appeared on each side of him and they were raised in light together. Enoch was raised in light. Moses was raised in light. Isaac was raised in light. I know Buddhist monks that practice turning to light. White light. Rainbow light. I met a Buddhist that had been in retreat for 30 years, retreat for 30 years, with a group of Buddhists that were practicing turning into rainbow light when they left. The whole body turned into this rainbow spectrum and left. They took the whole body with them. You are to raise this, this physical mass back into the spirit, back into the light. That is the power of ascension. Ascension is not just leaving your body and going up into the white light. Ascension, the truth of ascension, is this body, these emotions, this mind, will all be transformed into that white light, incorruptible, totality of the individuality of God manifest as the light, the final stage before we step into the crystal, to pure consciousness. The last body, the white light body, purity, the Christ consciousness, if you wish to call it that, you can call it the great white spirit, the spirit of purity, you can call it whatever you want, white light body, that's what will manifest. And after the turn of the century, you're going to see many of this. What, what the Christians call this is the up the sky rapture, where you'll be sitting there and with, uh, and they'll be in believers, there'll be believers at the table, and there'll be non-believers at the table, and in the twinkling of the eye, the believers will be turned to light right in front of the others who will be left behind. Well, the karmic board said, no, we don't just want that for part of that table, we want everybody at the table to go. The great white brotherhood says, all of us go. All of us. They've reached into the darkness and are pulling the souls out of the darkness. You should be praying for the devil instead of cursing and giving him power. You should pray him back to light, back to his true nature as the son of God, where he is. But we have cursed him and kept him separate, so we have fallen into the illusion of separation. We've fallen by this duality, illusion of duality. There is only one, there is only one, there is only one acting in that mother father who bore forth that, the children of light. So as we practice this rainbow bridge, we begin to expand our sight. As you begin to deepen your sight towards the earth, you have what they call an infrared manifestation of your light and energy. Your sight becomes infrared means you can see in the darkness. You can see in the darkness. I was walking around the house in the darkness last night and chanting and singing. And uh, as I laid there, I left the body, but I could hear my body still chanting and singing. And so could the, um, Conrad here, or John, or my good friend here. This morning when he woke up, I was still chanting. Because that's the power of surrender to the blue ray. 
So my body was under the protection of the blue light as I, the self, was able to leave. It was on Anami, because I chanted chants for 22 years. I just turned the chants on, just like you put on a record, and let them go in the ritual to bless all astrophysics students, past, present, and future, to bless all the ministers, teachers, healers, and counselors of the world, uh, to bless all the religions, that they may raise everybody in a godly way, that in all corruption religions be uh, identified and thrown out, that the purity and the perfection of God consciousness now is accessible to every human being. It isn't like, we'll tell you when you're holy. See, a lot of the churches say, well, you know, we're the intermediary between God and you, and so we'll tell you when you're holy. You know who tells you when you're holy? God. You can go directly to God. You don't need these intermediaries. They were there to help the people get there, and at one point they started standing between man and God. And that was the great separation. So we're strengthening our auras. The healing is coming back to our light consciousness. So clairvoyance, clair audio, extrasensory perception, telepathic powers, all are natural to human beings, and they will come back as we come at the turn of the century. These powers are going to be more and more prominent. Ten, in 1974, a survey was taken in the United States of people that had clairvoyant experience, and it was only 10% of the people in the United States had clairvoyant experiences at that time. Two years ago, they took that census again, and over 60% of the people have had some type of clairvoyant experiences. By the turn of the century, over 90% of the people will have that consciousness. It's that 60% now that has caused the momentum to go towards the revealing of all these powers and gifts again. You can fly in the spiritual sky, in the spiritual sky. You can fly in the spiritual sky. Ten thousand times, ten thousand suns, blazing all in that one, all across the Never feel it anymore. 
emotions in their space and time delve into your heart deep into your soul you will find the one that's one with the whole and lift into the flame on the sacred altar of your heart where you are one with God and never apart. You're never alone and you're always home in the heart of God's love.